at it and say, here are the people that are interested in this stuff. How, do, how can we break them up and try to appeal more or less to some, and, and maybe have to, have to just decide we're just not going to appeal to those pe like people who like that stuff. Um, okay, so the setting of the game world is created for the sake of fostering, in my opinion, memorable moments of role playing. All of this creation you're doing, all the set design, all that thing, is so that you can set up maybe that two minutes where that guy leaves everything else behind, engages in that awesome dialogue, final death or something like that, and they remember it, talk about it still, right? So you guys are all experienced LARPers, and you probably have, what, you know, 20 moments that you can recall, and every time you're drinking with your friends, you you do recall <laughs> those memorable moments. So when I'm creating a world, I'm thinking, what kind of a world, what kind of canvas is going to allow me to do that more often or, or more, you know, uh, more vibrantly so that it's etched in the minds of the people that participate in it. Um, now the problem with that is the two elements, in my opinion, which best promote that moment, promote those RP stressful uh, events, are often structurally in tension, and that is conflict and community. Okay? So the trick is, how do you bring in lots of conflict in the game? How do you pit players against each other, pit players against the environment, in a way that they can still retreat back into a community in which they can reflect and enjoy that moment? Right? Because if you just give them conflict, 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 there's no, there's no moment. right? But if you just give them community, well, then you're just living history reenactors and you're, you're camping on the weekend in, in cool costumes, right? So you want to sort of bring that, okay, here's all this, these, these are your people. So if you're a vampire LARP, say, you've got to be able to, you know, ch you know chill out with the, with the, with the Ventru and plot your next, you know, financial move or something like that. Uh, but that community also has to be in a place where it can go into conflict. With either within it or, or without. So LARP directors of various sorts try to bring conflict and community into the game either by structure, by plot, or by player-centered initiatives. So there's three ways you try to bring these about, the conflict element, I think. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these three devices, we'll say, or the ways of doing it. So the first way to bring uh, The first way to bring conflict into the game is to write it into the game. Right? Create the world such that they're already freestanding, uh, establishing the source of conflict within the parameters of the game. So, I mean, when you have like angels and demons, LARP, you know, I mean, structurally there's angels and demons. That's kind of a good, that's kind of a good background, right? You already have a conflict written into the structure. I, I, I didn't play it, so I'm not sure that's how it goes, but I'm assuming that angels are against demons this and stuff. This is exactly how I designed Kingdom Conflict. That's right. Exactly how I designed which is three factions who hate each other, and angels and demons are hunting them. Right. The only way to survive is to team up again against them. But they hate each other. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, that's the background of Albion, in a sense. And that what we have in Albion is we have five cultures on the fringe of society that have a bigger threat in common. So here you have Norse and Romans and, and Celts who dislike each other for religious reasons, political reasons, cultural reasons. And here come the Irish, sort of thing. <laughs> what do we do? We're all going to be pushed over this wall unless we do something together. Of course, already written into it is the fact that they don't really get along on various different um, axes of disagreement. So, for example, uh, in when, when I was writing uh, 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 Underworld Kalidor, um, there's poly polytheisms in most fantasy LARPs, right? There's a, you can have various gods. So, to put tension in, in Kalidor, we had one of the gods, <laughs> has sort of become a monotheistic, uh, entrenched, politically entrenched power in the world. And so all the polytheistic things are sort of under conflict, right? Because you're not one part of the one true religion. So that allowed us to do things like inquisitions and right? all these various things, which created tension in the writing of the world. Not because, you know, I particularly like monotheism, but because it's just historically proven itself to be awesome for conflict, <laughs> right? So that was sort of structurally written in it. Albion, as I pointed out, is it has these different factions, right? So if you're picked, you're not going to be so happy with uh, Roman Catholics. The Catholics coming in. <laughs> you're not going to be so happy with any non-Celtic peoples coming on the island, so you're going to have a problem with the Saxons. But the Norse are pagans too, but they're also trying to kill everyone you love. So, I mean, you have things where you agree, things where you disagree, that's sort of structurally in there. 
Um, and, and I just wrote down here, like, vampires have the competing clans or something. Well, like in our own setting, what we did is we took Edmonton and we split it down the middle. So there's two, basically, sects, right? Where one is, like, you know, the very feudal society, which is the Camarilla. On the other side, you have just that, which is, of course, very uh, religious, religious fanatics. fanatics, right? So the city itself is split, and then you have the infighting of the Camarilla guys on their own side, because there's seven clans, not one of them get along with each other. Sometimes they'll ally for temporary things. And then externally, Edmonton, because it's in a weaker position, is being torn upon by three competing cities who kind of want... Yeah, the external the forces, forces. So you have yeah. to band together. That's right. So it's like, okay, so we have to stop this back. We have to stop ourselves fighting each other, but these guys from outside the cities have backed people within the city for their own purposes. So who do you side with and why? And that's yeah. the answer. So like, we've all been down this road, it sounds like. Here's yeah. what you're trying to do. You're trying to say, how do we get faction with at the same time giving them the ground where they have to work together? And that's that's the balance you're trying to do. And if you keep in mind, you know, fun, as the issue here, and are they able to actually do something here? So race is always an issue, culture, religion, political motives, all of those things you can write into the story, into the into the setting, mm -hmm. such that people can in, find conflict there, right? I, you know, religious differences is always a source of conflict, racism. Like when you get into a lot of these fantasy larks where you have elves and dwarves and things like that, you have written into it, you know, dwarves don't trust elves, there you go. Well, you have a conflict ready to go at any moment. Uh, the problem with it, one of the main problems that come out about this is once you write all that structure in there and you hope that that's going to lead to conflict, is this is what we call the snowflake syndrome, you're probably familiar with <laughs> And the idea is I've written all of this, uh, you know, religious animosity into the world and then the players come in and say, yes, but I, alone in the world, welcome all religions, right? And they will just go against all of the, like, here's, people in your culture believe this basically and they'll say, and I believe the opposite, right? <laughs> I want to be the dwarf that loves elves, right? I want to be the pixie that doesn't use magic or something. So, I mean, you can write a lot of structure in there and give them the ground, and then they just don't want it. They just, you know, they don't touch it, they don't engage in it. Especially when it gets into historical things like, these guys are very sexist. Yeah, but we're not. <laughs> we're the only Vikings that aren't sexist, right? And, you know what I mean? It just, right? And this, this, this sort of thing, like, so my principle in dealing with that is um, that players who RP in the spirit of the game world and these structural constraints should see the world respond to them in kind. So if you respect women in their power roles and disrespect them in ones that are not culturally adequate to the historical setting, then, I mean, you should get punished or re rewarded insofar as you play that. So, right, if you are a, a Roman who, you know, takes his discipline seriously, and, you know, the Celts say, come on, come out and fight you, you know, right? And, and the, the guy who leaves the line to go and fight him, he's gonna get punished after that, right? And you say, no, I'm the one Roman who doesn't care about this one. Well, then you're a bad Roman, and you will be treated in our world accordingly. Right? And in some yeah. ways, that's good, right? It's right. good to have people who buck against authority, but you have to kind of make sure the player's aware. Like, that's right. You were going to get treated like trash. <laughs> you know that, right? In right. the vampire setting, there's clanless, K tip, right? Everyone, and the big thing is you get to choose your powers, right? And everyone's like, I want to be that. I'm like, you do realize that you, somebody could go and use you as a footstool, and that's okay, that's right? right? <laughs> you don't have any rights, yeah. yeah. I mean, we have that, we had that in Underworld, right? You could play a goblin, yeah. but goblins are oh. the only race with no rights. So if I kill you and everyone sees it, I can still say, it was a goblin. <laughs> and it's not illegal, I can do that, right? And so when you take that on, as long as they're aware that that's... Mm -hmm. See, if you take on a goblin, you say, but I want to vote. Well, then yeah, don't man. play a goblin. <laughs> or in-game, fight for goblin rights. <laughs> <laughs> right? You can get in the game and start fighting for the rights of goblins if you want. That, yeah. Which could be like, fun in itself, right? But Like that one guy did for the uh, Wood Elf, the, the guy with glasses, uh, Joel. Right. Yeah, he, he turned, turned everybody right around. So we had these sort of wild elves that were considered, you know, the scum of the earth in this setting. And the first guy to play it was just treated like the scum of the earth. And then by his actions and continually being heroic, it sort of changed the, the, the Caledorian worldview about Woad. And then, Completely. so by the time you played a Woad, it, it was a little better, it wasn't great. <laughs> because I was playing the Duke and I'd be like, Woad, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Who said you can speak, you know? And, and my point here is the way you avoid that sort of snowflake syndrome is to make sure that your game world responds and values people who immerse. It's and, the exception for You get conflict. 